If you've got your Bibles this morning, I've got a word from God for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 20. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. Anytime, I'm not going to lie to you. There's some times that God sends me here to preach, and i got a good message for you, but there's other times that I feel something from the heaven's glory that has given me a word for the church. And when I feel that, I feel like that it's just a joy. I feel an excitement about that because it, it's alive. Uh, it's one thing to have a Bible study about things that we do know and things that we understand. But every now and then, God wants to remind us of some things and bring us back into His great promise. Amen? Ecclesiastes 2 and 20. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. Solomon said, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. Real quick, glance with me if you can on the screen. I imagine she can throw it up quickly. John 16 and 21. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of her child, she remembereth no more the anguish for her joy that a man is born into the world. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to talk to us this morning. Move on our hearts and our souls and our minds. Stir us up, God. There is a promise within us. There is a promise in your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, and the church said amen. You may be seated. There was a woman in the Bible. She was a Shunammite, a Shunammite woman. Shunammite. Say that four times fast with your left hand on your right eyeball. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, she was a Shunammite woman. And this woman was a good woman. And she must have had some means in her family or whatever. But somewhere along the line, she saw that the man of God needed a place to dwell, needed a situation. And they made a room for this man, for the preacher. And when he would pass through, he would stay at their house and he would dwell with them. And, and it, it moved on his heart for the woman. And he asked his servant, his eyes said, what does this woman need that God might do for her? And he'd ask the woman, and she said, I didn't require anything. I just was seeing to your need. You know, whenever you see to the work of God, God sees to your need. When you put your mind on the work of God, God takes His care and His time to put His mind on the things that you need. And I promise you, He knows what you have need of even before you ask. And He's a better supplier than you ever thought about being. I, I, in case I didn't tell you, I'm talking about this morning, my promise is greater than my despair. My promise is greater than my despair. This woman walked in and he said, I'll tell you what I want to do. He says, God's going to give you a son. You're going to have a child. And, and that child is going to be yours. And, and she says, hey, preacher, don't, don't deceive me. I, I didn't ask for anything. Don't, don't get my hopes up. Man, and God says, you're going to have a child. The Bible says she had an old man. If you ever wonder where her, the term my old man came from, I don't think this was it. But anyway. But she did, the Bible does say, she had an old man. And he, you know, old men don't have a lot of young, don't have a lot of children. It was, uh, it, it was it's kind of funny, my brother-in-law is retiring. And uh, Byron, he, he was telling me the other day, he says, I'm excited, he said, because God saw fit when I was 40-something years old to give me a child. I got a little baby. He says, I'm fixing to get to spend a summer with her. I'm, I'm, I'm retiring. I'm, I'm going to get to spend some time with her before she starts kindergarten and, and she's all tied up for the next 12 or so years. And while she's a little child, I'm going to get to spend every day with her for a while. That's exciting. You know, not many people in their 40s with their right mind have kids. <laughs> Amen? I, I mean, it, not many people in their right mind at that age have children for a good reason. Because you just can't handle it. I mean, you're, you're more prone to heart attacks and stress and, and, and indigestion and all that. And I mean, it, it's, when you're 20, 23, 25 years old, them kids going zoom, 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 zoom. Ah, no big deal. Yeah. I, 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 you know, some of y'all have them children at them older ages. That's okay with me if you want to. I don't care. 
Uh, God, God sees, hey, look at how old, old, old uh, Sarah was when she had Isaac and Abraham. I mean, 90 years old. You think your bones ache now. Could you imagine being about 90 years old and, and got, got to pick up on some little two-year-old that's pulling on your coattail and mommy, can we go? Can we go? Can we go? Can we go? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you're walking back then. I mean, you can't even go fast in a car. But the Shunammite woman, she is desiring of something. And although she never expresses this desire, something in her response to the preacher, don't deceive me, opens up your understanding that there is a hunger within her. There is something on the inside of her that is crying out for a child to be born. She has been touched on the very raw nerve of her soul that she was too afraid to express openly for the fear that it wouldn't come to pass. You see, there are some things in our lives that God would like to give promise to. There are some things in your walk with Him and your daily living that God knows what you have. Sister Lucy, He knows. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm one of these. I, I do this every now and then, Brother Peshachai. It happens. I mean, please don't think I ain't got no faith when I tell you sometimes I'm just afraid and even ask. Because usually those things are the closest to our soul. They're, 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 the, they're the thing that burns within us at night. It is despair. It hurts. It's a pain. It's, it, it's anguish. And, and when you think on it, it, the fear of it not happening it just, it's almost greater and it causes us not to even want to ask. And this Shunammite woman got her promise. The Bible says that that little child one day was out in the field with his dad. Fell over. Poof. Just, just gone. Basically dead. Not quite, but dead. I mean, what's the difference in a few hours, right? I mean, if you ain't talking and you're not up running around, I mean, we're all flesh. We're all dead. It's just a few weeks away. Maybe more for some, less for others. Hopefully more for all of us, but that's, you know. But when you ain't breathing and talking and moving, it's just a matter of a few minutes. It's just, it, 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 it's just already done. Dad takes and gets a servant and says, take the child home, sends him home, and, 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 and he takes him to his mother, and his mother sits there and holds him until the last breath comes out of his body. What despair, what anguish, what horrible, gut-wrenching feeling that had to have been for the Shunammite lady. Here, God promised her a son. Somewhere along the line, though, her anguish and despair became minimized in comparison to her promise. She started in her mind recognizing that God gave me a promise. God gave me a promise. God, who cannot lie, gave me a promise. And she said, I tell you what you do. Let's get this boy up there and put him on the preacher's bed. Get up in the preacher's room and set him on the bed of the preacher. And she said to her husband, saddle me a donkey or a mule or an ass or a goat or a, 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 a Volkswagen or something. She says, I'm going to find the preacher man and it shall be well. I, I don't know, Brother Roger, I, 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 it's, it's a hard thing to think in my mind that a mama just losing her baby, just the promise just died. And the first thing she says after she put that child where it should be and made preparation to go see the preacher, she said, it shall be well. You see, her promise was greater than her despair. There are times in our living and our walks through this world that our despair blocks our vision of our promise. Our despair blocks our hope. It blocks our joy. We don't see a road through our problem. We don't see our way through. Our promise has been erased because of our despair. But this woman, she said, wait a minute. I've got a promise. I'm not letting go of it. She went and found that preacher and thrust herself and grabbed him by the legs. Now, Gehazi is a bit of a carnal dude, but he was a faithful servant. and 
he thrust her away. And the preacher said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There is something heavy troubling this woman. Now, I, I, I know the Lord opens my eyes to a lot of things in our lives, in your lives. Brother Hart, you know, there's times that I'm sitting around just twiddling my thumbs and, and God begins to talk to me about you and about Brother Corey and about Brother Hodges and, and, and Sister Vigil and, and Brother Roger and, 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 and you know, every, every now and then, you know, just, just, but Brother Noah, he even talks to me about you every now and then. It's, it's good things. But not, every, not all the time, not everything that you go through in life does God show me about. Just like Elisha. Elisha looked down and it was like, oh no! God hid something from me. He didn't want me to know about it. I don't know about you, but I believe that God did that for the Shunammite woman's miracle to be fulfilled. You see, had God shown Elisha what was going to happen, Elisha would have been there to intervene, to build up her spirits. But that Shunammite woman had to weigh out on her own her promise versus her despair. What God had promised her would be fulfilled or would it be held back by her despair? Would her fear or her faith govern her walk with God? What is it going to be? Is she going to get angry and bitter or is she going to yield and let God have His way and say, God, you gave it to me. I'm going to lay Him right back down on the same preacher's bed that promised it to me. The same man, the prophet of God that gave me the word from God. I'm going to put this child right back there where I got it from. And to God be the glory. It's all going to be good. It's all, that's a hard thing to do. You know, too many times we want somebody to ride in on a, on a white horse with a big old sword and say, I'm going to fix everything for you. I'm going to tell you what, your promise has already got it fixed. And somebody should have just got that right there. Your promise has already got your problem and despair fixed. Amen. Abraham had a promise. Abe, I tell you what, Come out from among them. I'm going to give you a land and everywhere you put your foot is going to be yours and your children. And for all, it's, going to, it's all theirs. On and on and on and on for a perpetual promise. All right. Come on, guys. Let's go. And off they go. Sister Knowlton, I don't understand how they did it. I mean... They left the seat of civilization. Let me explain. The first civilization in the world was what civilization? Anybody got a guess? Really? Nobody, nobody took history? Okay. It was the Sumerians. They had the first written laws. They had the first writing. They had everything. This And this is where... Right in that neighborhood. I don't, I don't know if they live around the block, down the street. I don't know where it was. Just, just trust me, it was in the neighborhood, okay? Within five or 6,000 miles. No, <laughs> no, I'm joking. They're closer than that. That's where Abraham was. Abraham wasn't far from this civilization. This is the same seat where Babylon is and, and, and was. And, and all, you, know, you, you hear about Iraq and all the weirdness. Why is this, this, is, this is the heart of civilization. Perpetually, all through time, there has been a civilization of people in this area. And here it is. And God says, come out of civilization... And go amongst the backwoods people because I'm going to give them, give you their land. I'm going to give it all to you. And for your children, all your seed for generations, it's, it's going to be theirs. Now that, that's a promise, somebody. That's a promise. I want to read a scripture to you though that, that Abraham got to become in despair. And Abraham said, Lord, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless. That's hard to have a promise for your generations to follow and you ain't got no kids. It's hard to see the promises of God in your life. The financial blessing when you ain't got no job. By the way, if there is a man in the church that needs a job, you need to come see me. It's not a high paying job, but it's not a, you don't have to have a lot of skill either. Come see me. Well, we'll see what we can do. But um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's nothing wrong. And, and I ain't got nothing against women that want to work with your hands. You want to work with your hands? It's a work with your hands job. And uh, cold weather, hot weather, it's a, it's a job. It's work. 
and it paid. So come see me. Anyway, be saw on the other side of that. It's hard to forsake. Matter of fact, such a chamois, I need to talk to your nephew. That's who you get, get hooked. Me. This is a career for him. It may start off small, but he's well, he ain't small, but this is the beginning of his life. So, <laughs> but uh, here, here, here we are. Abraham, I'm giving it to you and your children. It's a gift. I ain't got no kids. It's hard to have a promise of a new car when your bank account's empty. Amen? God knows how to supply it, right, Sister Tanya? I, I, I don't tell you, I just, I love that car of yours. I just, I, I, I'm thankful God bless you. I believe it. They, they got all that fixed for you? Amen. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, you know, it's good when God gives us greater than we deserve. Not that you don't deserve greater, but that's, that's not my point. That's such a, you know, some of us guys look at our women. We ought to say, man, God's given me greater than I deserve. Amen. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. Some of us ought to look at our kids and say, God's given us greater than we deserve. Some of us ought to look at our church and say, God's given us greater than we deserve. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, I thank God for this church. I thank God for each and every one of you because this is a kingdom of God marching on to heaven. I see glory in this place. Amen? I see glory amongst us. And, and sometimes we get our eyes fogged and clouded. And, and every now and then, just like brothers and sisters, we kind of get on one another's case. But let me tell you something, we've got a promise here. There's a promise in this house. And I believe it is for whosoever will. Amen? But let me get back to Abraham. He said, yeah, I have no children, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Despair. What am I working for? What am I doing it for? Lo, one is born in my house as mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord. Now, let me get, let me, let me get a little, little teaching here real quick, okay? Most of the time, almost all of the time, that you see the, where it says the word of the Lord, you can convert it to the plan of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was what was God. That word, word, is, it means the thought, the plan, or the idea of God. So if we look at this, and behold, the plan of the Lord came unto him. And behold, the plan of the Lord came unto you in the middle of your despair. You see, somewhere along the line in our despair when we will talk to God, He'll open up our carnal eyes and give us vision and reveal unto us the plan that He has for our life. Abraham, Jesus is of your loins. Abraham, Jesus is going to bless all mankind. He will be of your seed, not of your servants. He will be of your loins and not of another. That's the plan of God. I'm going to tell you what that ought to, whenever God moves on you and says, hey, through you, not through some other far off force, but through you and through your walk, your kids are going to be changed. It says, this shall not be thine heir, but thou shalt come forth of thine own bowels and shall be thine heir. Abraham. Promise is greater than despair. Anybody ever get weary in walking for God? Well, I forget walking for God. Anybody ever get weary in going to college? You know, I, anybody in here ever ever graduate college all the way and working? I haven't. Okay. Well, we got a lot of college grad, college grads in here. <laughs> when you make it through. Oh my goodness, the days and the weeks and the months and the da 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 da. Brother Hart, you're doing it for that graduation day. I got a friend of mine, Dr. Inbody, he told me about his education and the hard work that it took to him. Somebody pick up the phone and invite somebody to church. We got 99 here. Y'all go count and see if there's a kid hiding underneath the chairs. <laughs> but, but, so, Sister Marlene, it wasn't easy. It was a difficult road to become the doctor that he is. 
the days, the weeks, the month, the teachings, the working to pay your way through school. But brother, he did it every day knowing that when I get that piece of paper and I can start practicing my craft, I'm going to make money and it's going to be worth it all and the effort's going to be made. You see, when we do our effort, living for God is no different than anything else. We must press forward to the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. We are looking for that day when we hear the Lord say, Come home, my children. We're waiting to hear the trumpet sound and for the dead in Christ to rise and the saints to rise to meet them in the air. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're going forward for. But in the meantime, He has promises upon this earth and upon this hour that if you will seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all all these things shall be added unto you. While you're sitting in your moment of despair, let me tell you the promise of the Lord is yea and amen. He said He would never leave you nor forsake you. He would heal your body. He would save your soul. He would provide your finances. Yea, I was young and I am now old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. There is promises in the midst of your despair that you need to grab a hold of. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. I feel God trying to talk to us this morning. I am telling somebody this morning, if you do that which is right, is God mocked? No, He's not. Is God a liar? No, He's not. Brother, no, He said He cannot lie. I'm telling you what, Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever. He told them in the children of Israel, if you'll come out of Egypt, I'll sustain you. I'll take you to a land that floweth with milk and honey. There was many days of despair on the dusty roads all the way to Canaan land. But I tell you today, that it, when they got there, it was everything that Jesus Christ said it would be. Unfortunately, they weren't everything they said they would be. There's always two parts to every promise. I'll, I'll remind you that. You see, Abraham was about ready to give up, and God reminded him of the promise, and Abraham kept going. Some of us set it out for God. We set out on the road to live for God, and God has promise in our life, and, and we've got to be so careful not to divert ourselves from the road that God has set for us. Sister Graham, God never, if, if Abraham just would have just, just, just kept going on, he didn't need to figure out what it meant. How many of y'all have ever heard of, 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 of Ishmael? That, that, that's, that's, that's Isaac's half-brother. Ishmael was Abraham trying to bring about God's promise. Well, I've heard it said, but Brother Abino, you know, it's not right. It's not true, and I'm going to show you. But the first time that, God, that Abraham had ever heard that Sarah was to be the mother of his promise was after Ishmael was born. Right. Well after. And it would have been okay, Brother Roger, if Ishmael had come along because there was no Bible saying it was wrong. God never said it was wrong. But it's what... Abraham had determined to do with Ishmael that made it wrong. Abraham fell in love with something that wasn't a promise. Amen? Amen. Don't fall in love with something that's not a promise. God's not a halfway God. There is no substitute for promise. Promise is not substituted by something else. And when you hold up something else, in place of your promise. You can lose your promise. Hello? Ishmael came along and Abraham argued with God to make Ishmael the promise. And God said, no! I don't know if God was rushing. If He was, He would have said, yet! And I'm not Japanese. Otherwise, I'd say what He said in Japanese. But maybe He just shook His head like this. I don't know. That's not the promise! His despair was enthused by the promise. Even when it came to the fact that he realized that he had invested in something that was not his promise. He had laid groundwork into something that was not the promise of God. He realized that and he said, wait a minute. The promise is greater than my despair. Long live the Lord. Blessed be His name. Amen. When we recognize that our despair is only temporal, our moment of starvation, our moment of sadness, our moment of grief is only temporal. In comparison to the promise. I don't know about you, but I've done things in my life 
And don't raise your hand because I don't want anybody to hurt your shoulder throwing their hand up so fast. I have to be praying for every last one of y'all in here. But we've all done things in our life that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt. We know that we know that we know that we know that it would put a fence between us and God. And when we realize that, that's, Sister V. Hill, I, I don't know if you realize it or not, but that's why some people don't like to hang out with you. Because you're godly, you're holy, you're true, you're righteous. And when people hang out with you, conviction falls on their heart. That's right. You know, Brother Hart, that's why some people don't come to our church. They want to live in the world, be like the world, be lost. They don't want to live for God, so they don't really like your invitation to church. Hello? I, I, I'm just, it's the truth. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. That's despair. That's despair. But the promise of the Lord says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I tell you that there's a promise that if any sinner walks in those doors and walks down to that altar, every sin that they've ever committed when they repent of them will be forgiven. No matter what it was, how big it was, how long it was, or anything else. It don't matter how recent it was. Jesus Christ will forgive them of all of their sin. I'm telling you that the despair of sin is overshadowed by the promise of salvation. By the promise of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that we don't have to be lost, but we can be born again in Jesus' name. Amen. The promise of the baptism of Jesus washing away all of our sins. The promise of the infilling of the Holy Ghost having our feet on the heavenly road. I'm telling you that it doesn't matter what I've done. I've been born again. And my promise says that born again experience will carry me all the way to Calvary. All the way to heaven. All the way to eternity. Amen. The devil, get on out of here with your blues. I'm not interested in it. I am not going to hold on to my despair, but I am going to live for my promise. I am going to live for the truth. I'm going to live for the Word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There was a, let me back up and lay the groundwork for... There was a woman by the name of Hannah in the Bible. Hannah, something about it, even today, it's not a, we, don't, we don't consider it as much today as they used to. But I, I've heard women that even in up in age, they get married, remarried, whatever. Widows getting married. There's something about getting married that they want to produce a child of that union. It's a promise, almost, of the union. It's a promise of the relationship. It's a child. It always has been. It always will be. But it just may not be as dramatic as it used to be. And in, in the old days, it, 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 it was a shame if you were a mother, a woman, and married and had no children. It, it, just, it just was a curse on your life. And, and, it, you know, and I, I just imagine Hannah saying, you know what, wait a minute. I am married. I'm supposed to have children. Here's this other woman my husband married. I know he loves me. He loves me so much. But my promise is being left me. I just, there, there's an inherent, unwritten covenant of offspring. That's why we get married. That's, that's why, Brother Hodges, friends are not in covenant. You may have a partner. <coughs> Forgive me for getting there, but you, you know, it, it might be your partner. It might be your lover. But there can't be no children from it, so how can there be a covenant? There's no offspring. There's no promise to it. Will I promise my heart to you? I love you. You weirdo. <laughs> but there's some promises and some covenants. And please don't nobody say that i got an attitude against people that think that way. I believe God will forgive them of all their sins and heal them of that. Amen. Just like I preach against liners, I preach against all sin, but I love every sinner. But... 
the promise. Hannah got in there and she said, wait a minute. I want a child. Her husband showed her love. Her husband showed her dedication. Her husband, he, when he would set her food before her, she would always get a better portion than his other woman. She would always get better. It got to the point, Sister Marlena, that, that her despair was entering into the home. She couldn't keep... Brother, Brother Hodges, and, and we always try to hide our hurts. We don't want nobody amplifying it, talking about it, broadcasting it. And give you... Can I do some marriage counseling real quick? I'm going to help you gentlemen. I'm going to help you wives. You ready? Men are supposed to be powerful, strong, and hard workers. That's what they're supposed to be. That's what we are, and that's what we envision ourselves to be. And when you're 120 years old, that's what you still see yourself as. Right. Ladies, let me help you help your marriage. Don't destroy their image of themselves. Let me, let me say this. I, I, I feel it's in the Holy Ghost, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but I, I just want to say this. I just, just, just hear me just for a second. When you peck away by amplifying their infirmities, let me get Brother Carlos. He's a young man. He ain't got no infirmities. His wife says, thinks nothing, but he is just he's the Mac Daddy. But one day, Brother Carlos, one day, as you get older, your body's going to get weaker. Just going to happen. It's just going to happen. It's imperative, ladies, and, and when, I, when I preach on something that will apply, i got some lessons for men too, okay? But let's talk to the ladies for a minute. Is that okay? It's imperative that you lift them up. It's one thing to be concerned, but it's another thing that every time that they open that refrigerator door and grab a, a, a Pepsi Cola, if you say something to them every time, you're amplifying their weakness. Well, you really shouldn't be eating that sausage. You know what that does to you. He knows! But you're telling him he is weaker than the sausage. And you're creating, in his mind, weakness. You're shattering who he is. And you're bringing him down. And then one day you're going to turn to him for that strength. And he's going to be weak because you've encouraged it. It's one thing to show concern. You go to the doctor and you see your husband laid on the floor, don't kick him and say, Hey, you're supposed to be a big old boy. Get up, lazy bum. No, he had a heart attack. Help the dude out. <laughs> but lift your... Really recognize that. Recognize that. that, that ladies, let me, let me just... I, I'm going to show you the equivalency of it. I'm going to show you the equivalency of it, can I? That's just like if your husband were to amplify your physical faults. That's the man's pride, is his work, his power, his strength, his might. A woman's pride is her beauty. How'd you like it every morning your husband wake up and say, Babe, you need to go put some makeup on. <laughs> Am I making sense? I'm sorry, I, I'm just feeling this in the Holy Ghost right now. It, we may be laughing about it, but I do feel this in the Holy Ghost. I, I, I believe that the promise of our marriage needs to come to fulfillment. Anything that would come in the way of it will destroy it, not amplify it. We need to build better marriages. You need to look at your wife with, 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 with you know, the drool running outside of her mouth onto the pillow and crust all in her eyes and her hair all matted from sweating and say, You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen! Likewise, you ladies, when you see your husband struggling to pick up a pin off the floor, you need to just, man, babe, you are awesome. I promise you to make your marriage better. Hello? Amen. Don't amplify the weaknesses. Amplify the, ble the good things. Amplify the promise. I, 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 if you'll amplify the promise, I promise you that God will fulfill it. Amen. Hello? All right, back on. I, I didn't get off, but I'm, I'm going to get back to where I was at. Hannah got in the altar, and she began to pray. Her husband said, Am I not better to thee than ten sons? No, you're not. You're a good guy, but you're not the promise. 
The promise is a result of our relationship that I don't have. I'm in anguish because my promise hasn't arrived. You see, walking with the Lord brings about certain promises. The Lord said that He wants to give you His Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost this morning, you're walking outside of the promises of God. Hello? If you're not full of the Holy Ghost this morning, you should realize that you are in a place of despair, but the promise of the Holy Ghost is greater than your despair. Your promise to be filled with His Spirit, all of your sins forgiven, remitted, washed away, holiness upon your life, is a great promise. And if you don't have it this morning, you ought to recognize that and say, I'm not going to be satisfied until I have the promise. Sometimes people come to these altars and they're really hungry for God and, and they, you try to pay attention to them and they, they just, they, they're, they're, they're just hungry. Just like Hannah, she got to the point where she just, and the old Eli the prophet, he was full of uh, whatever he was full of. Probably pork ribs. That'll sink in in a minute. They weren't supposed to eat pork. And he was the priest and he was a sinful priest. He, but he did have respect for the house of God. Hello? He may not have had respect enough for God to raise his kids right. That, I'm going to knock a preach on right now, but I ought to. If you've got enough respect for God, you will raise your kids right. Not causing your kids to live for God, to train them right, is means you don't have respect for God. That's right. I'll get off of that. Lord bless you. Amen. Yes. <laughs> A word of the wise is sufficient, that my mom always said. But God gave her a promise because she was so full of despair. I don't know, Brother Hodges, exactly when it clicked, but in the midst of her pouring out of tears upon that altar, promise came to her. The man of God said, it'll be. Now, I don't know about you, but somewhere along the line in my life, when the promise was revealed, joy came in. I don't care how much you are in despair. You got a promise from God, you ought to write it down on a piece of paper and stick it to your windshield and stick it to your mirror and everywhere else. And if there's a place that you feel... You know what? Brother Hodges, I, I, I don't know if inflation keeps going up. I know you're retired on a fixed income. And that, 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 that cupboard starts getting bare. You ought to put a promise on there. I've never seen a righteous forsaken nor a seed and begging bread. And every time you get ready to open that refrigerator door and it's empty, you've got to look at the promise. It's going to be full. It's going to be full. He said He would supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory. And until heaven goes bankrupt, guess what? Your needs are going to be met. Your needs are going to be met. Jesus Christ will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. I'm going to tell you what, Brother Carlos, I believe that glory is a heavenly place and it's pretty well off. Amen? Amen? You know, Abraham. Back on Abraham for a second. I'm disturbed about Abraham. When the promise was on the way, what would have happened had Abraham decided to push Ishmael to the point that he broke his covenant with God? I want to think on this for a second. You see, in our despair, again, the sin wasn't Abraham's relationship with the woman. It was that he made the child the promise that God didn't make a promise. It was okay that he had a relationship with Ishmael and the, whatever Hagar. There's no scripture. If you can find it, bring it to me. I will retract my statement. There is no condemning scripture that he had a second wife. None. But second is not first. That's where he made his mistake. In watching this, it bodes a question. Brother Corey, I've always asked these questions. I, I got questions all the time. Was there an Abraham before Abraham? Think about that. Was there an Abraham before Abraham. Brother Roger, was there somebody else that had a promise? 
that had a covenant with God. But he made Ishmael his promise. You see, you might be sitting here today with a call of God on your life, but if you miss it, Brother Peshachai, if you miss it, God will raise up one to follow after you. You might be sitting here with all the glory, but you take your promise and you swap it for something that's inferior, I'm going to tell you that God will find somebody else to bestow a promise on. I can prove it in the Word of God. You ready? When the children of Israel rebelled, what did God say to Moses? Anybody remember? Get out of the way. I will slay them and I will raise a promise up unto you. Brother Roger, only a humble man could have accepted that. Does anybody know the name of either one of Moses' sons? That's weird, ain't it? He literally had the opportunity to have his child carry the promise to replace Isaac. He literally had the opportunity to have his children named in the annals of history. But he was more concerned about the church. He was more concerned about the promise that had been bestowed upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was more concerned about what God would be seen amongst the Gentiles than he was his own flesh and blood. Thank God. But God would have raised it up because God promised it. I'm going to tell you what. You better be careful about in placing another in the way of your promise. God will take care of you. God will supply for you. But Sister Marlena, there's only one promise from God and that's the promise you need to believe in. And forget making something a promise. Don't try to convince God on a promise. You stick with God's promise. Isaac may not be here yet, Brother, brother No, It might be a long time and you may not even see how it's going to happen. You may not even understand it, but there will come a time when you all of a sudden you're going to wake up one morning and bump your head and God's going to open up your eyeballs? Y'all yeah, remember them old dolls? When you sit them up, their eyes open. You lay them back and their eyes shut. <coughs> but every now and then, you're, you know, your kid playing with too much Kool-Aid got something sticky in the eyeballs and he just stopped opening. That's kind of like us. Sometimes we get peanut butter in our eyes. We get bubble gum stuck, our eyes stuck shut. We can't see the promises of God. I'm going to tell you what, we need to ask God for an eye-opening experience. Because God, every last one in here, God's got a promise for you. God has hope for you. God has joy for you. God, and you forget the despair. Forget the anguish of the hour. Get your mind on God and say, God, I'm believing in my promise. I'm holding for my promise. One day I know it will come and there is nothing going to move me from it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me move on here. Let me talk about David. David anointed king of Israel when he was a young man. I mean, what, a, what more of a humiliating experience than Israel had for anointing a king? This, just, this always, I get a kick out of this stuff. When I, I, when I read something, I see it in, in, in visual pictures, colors, kind of like cartoons. It's kind of weird. I like cartoons. But this is how, you know, y'all seen the, the, you know, y'all seen the movies where an author was, you know, put the crown on his head or, or whatever king or whatever, you know, there's these great ceremonies and do, 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 do. they toot the horns and all the pomp and circumstance and all the things like that, right? And it's such a beautiful royal affair. They're all dressed up in their beautiful array. Not Israel. Would anybody like me to anoint you like they anointed the kings of Israel? Come up here. I'll pour this over your head. And all your pretty hair do will turn into a greasy, mesh, mash, nasty. Man, what cool thing it was. I got anointed king. I look like a fool. Why? Because you need to be humble first. When God anoints you, it's not easy. Sometimes uh, I've seen people get the Holy Ghost all kinds of different ways, except for standing on their head. And it might happen. If you're a headstander, God may fill you with the Holy Ghost that way. I don't know. I just ain't ever seen it. But I'm going to tell you what. Every way I've ever seen somebody get the Holy Ghost, so there's one thing that's in, one, one common denominator. <coughs> Brokenness. Despair. The exhibition of their despair 
the need for a change in their life. And God says, I'll take your despair and I'll give you a promise. And when you open your eyes to the promise, if you forget of all your, repent of all your sins, I will be faithful and just to forgive them all. Boom! Eyeballs open. Thank God. All of a sudden, despair turns into joy. All of a sudden, sadness turns into singing. All of, next thing you know, the Holy Ghost falls. You start speaking in tongues. Joy changes your life. I, I, you, you can't explain it. It just undescribably just hid me from somewhere. But David, in his brokenness, was anointed. And years, years, he's fighting for the kingdom. He's working for the kingdom. All along the way, he's saying, I got a promise. I got a promise. I got a promise. I tell you what, it might have been hard to wake up every morning next to Saul's daughter. But there's a promise. There's a promise. There's a promise. I'm going to live for the promise. Hey, Saul! I know you don't like me, but we got war. Would you like me to fight for you? Would you like me to lead the armies? I'll do it. I'll go first. They sang songs that he had slain his ten thousands. But it got down to a point in Samuel chapter 27. And David said that in his heart, I shall not perish. Despair has fallen upon him. It has gotten to be too great. The promise is beginning to shadow. He said, I shall now perish one day at the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. He got to a point where his despair had totally and utterly overshadowed his promise. Let me show you what happened after this. When despair became his eyesight, he walked away from the promised land and he walked into the world. Did he sin? The Bible don't say he sinned. But he put himself under kingship of another king, not a promise. There will be times living for God that you'll say, I just, I've been living for God for 38,000 years. And I just don't see God doing anything better for me today than He ever has. And out of the walk, walking out of the back doors of the church, you'll find somewhere in the world to, re, to set yourself, to comfort yourself, to try to give a place for yourself. Because your eyes are upon you all of a sudden, not upon the kingdom. And while you're there, you're going to have a Ziklag experience. And one day David and his men came home to Ziklag, the place that they began to call home in the land of the Philistines. And you know, David didn't just walk out of the Israel by himself. He took a bunch of people with him. Why is it that nobody wants to walk away from the house of God without trying to drag people into hell with them? Our promise is worth living for, church. Our promise is that it just walked in these doors and sat across the front of this church is worth living for. They got to Ziklag and the city was on fire and every person was taken and all the souls were lost. Y'all kids, let's just, I'm almost finished. I want you to pay attention. But there he was in Ziklag. He had created his own kingdom. He had created a place for himself. God did not create Ziglag for David. David created... Let me tell you something. Just like what Abraham did with Ishmael. If you're not careful, you'll create your own way. It's akin. It's almost just like. It's pretty close. It makes me happy right now because, Brother Hodges, I was in a cave yesterday and I'm on the throne of a city today. He created his own throne. And he came home and all was lost. But whenever he got in the deepest part of his despair, he looked at the priest and he says, Hey priest, go get me the ephod. Go get me the ephod. I need to talk to God. You see, he said, I, I think back in the back of my mind that God said that He would never leave me nor forsake me. And my wife is gone. My children are gone. My home is destroyed. My whole city's on fire. I need... 
an encounter with God. And he got on his knees and he said, Shall I pursue? He was about to lose his own creation. God said, Go, and you shall recover all. You see, when you have a zigzag experience, you need to have an experience at an altar of repentance. You need to have a broken experience. You need to have an experience where you say, okay, God, I messed up. I created this on my own. It's time for me to get back to my knees and say, God, lead me, guide me. Hey, Mr. Preacher Man! Just like that woman did. Uh, that's, uh, that Shunammite woman. She went and found a preacher and said, my promise is broken. Get it back on course. Let me read to you how it worked out. Psalm chapter 30. Sister, would you throw this up there and work with me as I go? I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave and hast kept me alive, that I should not go down into the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye his saints of his, and give thanks to the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor hast thou made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried unto thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Be thou my helper. Thou hast turned me. Turn for me my mourning into dancing. And thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee. And not be silent, O Lord my God, I will give thee thanks forever. I'm telling this church today that you have a promise. Your promises are sure. Get your eyes off of trying to make a promise happen. Thank you, Lord. Get your eyes off of creating something and get your eyes on following the Lord. Amen. God has got a path laid out for you if you'll follow it one step at a time. One step at a time. Hey, you know, when you're playing football, they got a playbook. And if you'll follow that playbook, the goal is victory. Now the problem is, is men write the playbook and they don't always know what kind of enemy they're playing. But I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot fail. If you'll put your eyes on God, He made a playbook. Let me see your, let me see your Bible there, babe. I'll give it right back. If you'll follow the playbook. If you'll follow the playbook. This playbook has an answer for everything that you go through. You know, in the days of Elijah... They fought with weapons of warfare. There were swords, they were iron, they were horses, they were catapults and all that kind of crazy stuff. We fight a different warfare today. We, all, we never wrestle against flesh and blood. They weren't supposed to then, we weren't supposed to now. But the enemy will come at your gate with new things. It might be in the form of IRS agents. It might be in the form of lawyers. It might be in the form of sickness. It might be in the form of all kind of stuff. Finances and, 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 and lost jobs and, and broke down cars or whatever. But the angels that showed up on the doorsteps of Elijah, when he looked unto the hills and saw the mighty host of angels, they had weapons that was equal to the armies at the gate. I'm going to tell you what. God knows how to raise up an angel that can file a legal brief on your behalf to get you out of conviction. God knows how to bring up an angel that knows how to destroy the works of the IRS, the CIA, the FBI, San Juan County Police Department. God knows how a way to do it. If you'll trust in God, He's got a promise for you. He will not let you go. It will not slip. You don't have to go find some other solution. He knows how to heal your body. He knows how to, save. He knows how to fix your marriage. He knows how to restore your children to, to understanding and wisdom. He knows, He knows, He knows, He knows! 
I'm tell you, if you've got financial problems today, I'm going to tell you what, Jesus Christ has an answer for you. If you've got marital problems today, Jesus Christ has an answer for you. If you'll get your feet set on the promise, your answer will come to pass and it will not fail you. Just like David, his promise brought him all the way to Jerusalem and set him on a throne and he became the king of all, so much so that Jesus Christ was considered to be the son of David. God's got a promise for you today. Put aside the mediocre. Stop trying to make your own promises. Stop trying to make your own promises. Hold on to God. He's got your promise. And when His promises come to pass, joy, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, faith, God's got a right for you. There's some things that are just out of time. Hello? Some things are just out of time. Let God have His time. Let God have His due diligence. And watch God raise it up into righteousness. Amen? Hallelujah! Why don't we stand to our feet and let's talk to God right now. Why don't you get your mind on the promises of God for your life? Lord, I love you.